Hi there, my name is Stacy Goldring and I am the facilitator of Chapter and Notes book groups. I'm so glad you've joined me today. We're going to talk about a book, The House in Paris by Elizabeth Bowen. This is the third time I have tried to create this video for you. So let's just hope the third time is a charm. But maybe it was planned because this book is divided into three parts. I just thought of this. So, you know, whatever. The book is divided into three parts. I'm going to dive right in. Three parts. Uh, we have the present, and then we go back to the past, and then return again to the present at the end of the book. And that's very much like a well-made play where you have three parts and you have to assume some things between and betwixt in order to put all the pieces together to understand the story. If you are looking for a story uh, where a lot goes on, then you can go ahead now and just, well, of course, please like, subscribe, et cetera. But then you can just wait till I post about the next book because this book takes place over one day in a house in Paris. All right, uh, let me just back up for a minute and explain to you how I'm going to uh, explain the book so you can know exactly how our little talk today is going to be structured. I'm going to start off doing something I don't normally do, and that's give a rather detailed summary of the book. What I love about um, our book discussions is that I usually uh, dive right in and uh, I learn from you, you learn from me, et cetera. But in this case, because we're dealing with an author, Elizabeth Bowen, who likes to kind of bend time, uh, I think it's worth uh, giving a summary to you today where I go through each of the three portions of the book. From there, uh, I hope to explore with you um, the places of the book. Uh, because although it does take place in a house in Paris over one day, uh, there is a um, the section of the book, uh, the second section, we go back in time uh, to the past. And there are some times, uh, there are some space places we visit there that are very interesting, especially the back garden of a particular aunt's house. Oh my God, but stay tuned. Uh, and then I want to talk to you about the style and the themes of this book. And then go ahead and tell you about the author. If this interests you, I look forward to um, plunging right in, as Lady Colin Campbell would say, and telling you about The House in Paris by Elizabeth Bowen. Such a great book. Okay, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and first tell you that uh, we meet our first character, and her name is... Uh, um, uh, Henrietta Mountjoy, she's 11 years old, and she's on a train coming from England, and she's going to make her way to the south of France to uh, be with her grandmother. She's lost both her parents, and um, en route, she stops in Paris. She has uh, some time to spend there, a whole day, so she is going to go spend some time at uh, a, a friend of her grandmother's uh, house, so that, that's her plan. Uh, the scene opens, the first scene of the book, and she is uh, kind of tumbling off of the train. You know, she's groggy. It's early morning. And this woman's supposed to pick her up. Her name is Miss Fisher. Henrietta is a smart little girl. And she sums up Miss Fisher right away. And let me tell you, Miss Fisher is a nervous wreck. Henrietta senses all these things because, you know, children have a sixth sense. Uh, and Naomi Fisher, who comes to visit her, is nervous because she has uh, received a letter indicating that she also is going to be in charge with, an, with another child today. And Naomi really didn't want anyone at her house because her mom's sick and she wants to take care of her mother, Madame Fisher. But now she's going to be in charge, not of one child, and this is a woman who is not married and hasn't had children, so she really doesn't know what to do with children, uh, but she's going to have to take care of two. And Henrietta isn't happy because she thought it was just going to be her and perhaps she would go and get to see the sights of Paris, particularly she's interested in the Trocadero. Uh, but lo and behold, she's going to have to share the limelight with some little boy named Leopold. Not happy. All right, so she um, arrives at the house in Paris, at Naomi's house. She has a little lunch. She takes a nap. She wakes up and across the room staring at her is this weird little boy, Leopold. She's not comfortable. Naomi comes into the room and she summons little uh, Henrietta 
up the steps to see her mother. Now, this is kind of scary because already she feels a little trapped in this house in Paris. She wants to go out and visit. And now she has to go visit a sick old lady. This is kind of yucky. So she marches upstairs and she meets this woman, Madame Fisher. The author does a very good job of describing this kind of sick room to her. And any little kid is not interested in spending time really with someone who is sickly, elderly. She wants to, you know, go see the sights. And Madame Fisher explains to her that that little boy downstairs, her father, his father broke her daughter's heart. Her daughter being Naomi, who was sitting right there in the room. And she kind of describes uh, what happened to Naomi and the father's name was Max. And it was very, you know, it was a, a very tragic, it was a very tragic relationship. Naomi's, uh, excuse me, Henrietta is way too young to be hearing these things, but she takes it all in and basically thinking, where is the nearest exit? Because this is uncomfortable and that lady is kind of gross and I want to get out of here. Okay, so she goes back downstairs. Meanwhile, Leopold, while Henriette is upstairs feeling a little uh, claustrophobic, goes through Naomi Fisher's purse that she left in the drawing room uh, when they arrived at the house. And Leopold goes through the purse and he finds three letters. The first letter is from Henrietta's um, uh, Henrietta's um, grandmother explaining to Naomi that um, Henrietta's coming. Could she stay at your house? Uh, you know, she's going to be coming to stay with me in the South of France, but I, you know, she needs time in this during the stopover. The second letter has a postmark from Berlin and it is from Leopold's mother. Now Leopold is at the house because he is going to meet his mother for the very first time. He's a nine-year-old little boy. He has lived with his adopted family uh, or foster family uh, in Italy, and he has been brought to Paris in order to meet his mother. Inside of the envelope, there's nothing. The third letter is a letter that also contains some very interesting information. The third letter is from Leopold's um, adoptive parents, and it is explaining how to take care of Leopold when he arrives in Paris, basically stating Leopold is a very sensitive child. He has to be treated with kid gloves. He knows very little about his past. He has very little understanding of uh, uh, relationships, etc. So it's best to kind of smooth over any history with his mother and what happened between his mother and his uh, and his father. And basically, Strom don't say anything. Let's just let's just bear through this visit and get through it so he can't come home. Henrietta walks in and sees what Leopold is doing and is like, hey, that wasn't right. Anyway, they begin to play, etc., and the doorbell rings. We hear pitter patter, pitter patter. That's Naomi going to the door, and she walks into the drawing room. And the first section ends with her saying to our little Leopold, "Your mother is not coming. She cannot come." And that is the end of the first section. The scholar uh, Neil Cochran, who has written a piece on Elizabeth Bowen, says Leopold's reaction to his mother's fail failure, he tries to keep a strong face, but then he completely melts down. He says, Leopold's reaction to his mother's failure, quote, is the novel's most concentrated expression of the psychological and emotional wounding that is parentlessness. I'm going to repeat that. The no this is the novel's most concentrated expression of the psychological and emotional wounding that is parentlessness. Very powerful. Okay. Part two is the past. And it has a quote at the beginning of it. Meetings that do not come off keep a character all their own. Meetings that do not come off keep a character all their own. We remember those meetings that don't sit right. 
the pat in the past we go back a decade in this story and we are um we're going back uh to uh how leopold came to be so that is the meeting between leopold's mother whose name is karen and leopold's father whose name is max full disclosure i absolutely love this book like this book the house in paris by elizabeth bone i feel like i need to make like a uh, like some type of altar and just praise it it to me it is such a beautiful book it's a complicated book we are dealing with an author who has a style that's considered a uh, modernist so there's a lot of time bending as i mentioned and there is a lot of a uh, use of uh, the first, second, and third person could happen all in the same sentence. But trust me when I tell you to just go with it. And this is why. People who get frustrated nowadays when we read a book, we want to Google, we want to figure it out, we want to know exactly what the words are, what this meant, or what that place is. And it kind of um, it kind of makes what used to be the sacred experience of reading more like a frustrating homework assignment. So we don't allow ourselves the beauty of just trusting the author and just going with the story. But I've learned to let that all go because I have a friend who told me many years ago, I was trying to read Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. And I was like, what the heck is going on here? I am getting the Cliff's Notes. That's how old I am. And if you know what Cliff's Notes are, you are smiling. It's like Spark Notes or whatever, but it's before or ebooks. It's way before you know Google, um, the internet, the interweb. Anyway, um, I said I don't understand what's going on. Who's talking? Who's Clarissa? I'm getting a headache. Of what? Why? And my friend said, "Do you really think that Virginia Woolf wants you to run out and buy Cliff's Notes?" And I was like, "No." She said she wants you to just read the story. And that was a hall pass for me. If if you're listening to this video, Chance, and you found this because particularly if you Googled um, Elizabeth Bowen or The House in Paris, you are a serious reader. And you're probably someone who uh, wants to do well and understand every step of the way that you read so you have context as you move forward. But I'm telling you to stop. Just stop and just read the book. Understanding this, I'm now going to dive in to the past and the second part of this book. The introductory pages of this section, quote in the research I've done, make it clear that this entire except this entire section is imaginary, perhaps a long and dramatic imaginative vision on Leopold's part. So what we're reading in the past is completely the imagination of Leopold, who imagines what would have happened if he indeed meets his mother. Now think about all the tenses I've just played with there. What would have happened had he met his mother, which he just found out he wasn't going to, right? He would find out all this about his mother's past. Now, the first time I read this book, did not get it, did not get it, did not get it, loved it anyway, but didn't get it. And now that I'm rereading it again and have done copious amount of research on the book, I'm like, huh, interesting. Because I would argue only the first, the first part of the past uh, which is the second section of this book, is Leopold. I feel then the author does what I would call a Zuckerman or what um, Philip Roth does in um, in many of his novels, where the narrator all of a sudden becomes his character, Zuckerman. Yeah, as we segue back to the narrator speaking, so we go from Leopold and his imagination, where Leopold is actually imagining things his mother would say to him. yes. Leopold would imagine things his mother would say to him. And then we go right on to having a narrator. So if this confused you, welcome to humanity, because we are now going to keep going. So take a sip of coffee and just sit back and listen in. All right. So Leopold has no way of knowing 
several things. He has uh, no way of knowing about Max or how his mother met or anything like that. So he's thinking of what would have happened had he met his mother, okay? So, um, okay, so how can I present this to you? I'm just gonna say, this is what is now in the section, okay? Here's what is in the second section of the book. Uh, we learn uh, that um, we learned that Karen knows Naomi Fisher because Karen spent some formative years living in the House of Paris as she was finishing up her years of schooling. Girls from um, um, England were sent to Paris to learn about the culture, to learn about the continent, to be refined, perhaps to find a husband. And this was kind of like a boarding house that Madame Fisher ran. Uh, it wasn't a school or anything like that. But this is the first, this is how Naomi and how Karen become friends. And while Karen is living there, she sees this man, Max, who was friends, or there is something going on. You can fill in that blank because the art author isn't going to do it for you. Something is going on. There's some relationship between Madame Fisher and Max. So um, when we uh, first meet Karen, it is when Karen is engaged. Karen is engaged to a man named Ray. And I can't pronounce his last name because it's a little bit French, even though he's English. Forestrier or Forrester. I'm just going to call him Ray. So she is going to ma marry Ray, who is the perfect person. <clears throat> excuse me. Who is the perfect match for Karen. Her parents are pleased and she's going to marry this guy. And she feels very restricted. She doesn't want to marry him. She just, you know, it's just not a good fit. She doesn't know why. I would call her kind of like a depressive. She's just kind of meh. And Karen isn't happy. So she tries to stall. She tries to stall, 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 because this book deals with time. So instead of going ahead with the marriage, she stalls it by saying, you know what, I'm just kind of not feeling so great. I'm going to go visit my aunt, my uncle. This is her mother's sister uh, in Ireland. So she goes to Ireland to stay with her aunt and uncle. And she's just buying time. She doesn't know what she wants out of life, but she certainly doesn't want to get married. And we have exchanges of letters between Ray and between Karen, where he's like, uh, you really want this. I know you really want this. And she's like, I don't know if I really want it. I don't know. I mean, she stalls and even sending the letters back to him. And she finds out while she is there that her aunt is actually very sick and she's going to have surgery. We're not, ex we're not sure exactly what what she's been dot what her diagnosis is but we know it is very serious because her uncle is a nervous wreck and she's also pledged uh, not to tell her mother that her aunt is sick now karen has to keep a secret and not let her mother know that um basically her sister is dying so we're dealing with all of these things that are stalling uh keeping back information in order to move forward like I told you a few minutes ago, uh, when Naomi tells Henrietta that Leopold is coming to visit, she warns her not to ask him any questions. There's things he just doesn't need to know because she has been warned in the letter she received in the purse from Henry, from um, the adoptive parents, you know, please don't mention anything uh, to our little, very sensitive Leopold. So everyone is trying to withhold information, secrets, not say anything. So we're starting to build tension. This is, uh, I know I said I was going to talk about later, but I'm not going to talk about now. This is the idea of building tension. This is a modernist tool. Uh, we're building tension in this book. We're getting restricted. We're in a house. We are not going out sightseeing. That's all Henrietta wants to do. And throughout the whole book, you have this ambient. Uh, when are we going to go out and see Paris? I'm only here for the day of Harriet uh, happening. And now we have the tension layered on of our um Karen, who uh, doesn't want to get married. She doesn't want to move forward with the marriage. And then she finds out about her aunt, who she can't say to her mother that um, her sister is sick. So we're building layer upon layer of tension. Finally, Karen has to go home. She's kind of worn out her welcome. She's not moving forward there. So she goes home. And who is there when she arrives home? But her old friend, Naomi, from her days in Paris. 
So she meets Naomi. Naomi comes uh, to her house and she has the best news. Naomi is engaged. Who's she engaged to? That's right. She's engaged to Max. You remember Max, right? And Karen's like, Max, I kind of remember Max, but he gave me kind of a weird th- feeling. So, you know, congratulations, Miles. Talk, whatever. Have a great, have a great marriage. Naomi is insistent that Karen meet Max. This builds a layer of another layer of tension because we're not sure why. When I have discussed this book, uh, people have uh, shared that maybe it's because she's trying to push the envelope with Karen because she, perhaps Naomi sensed when they were both living in the house house in Paris that uh, Karen was maybe attracted to Max. So there's some weird catty thing going on. Or maybe it's because the friendship that they had when they were younger, when Karen was a lodger at the house in Paris, Naomi was kind of like her lap dog. Like she'd sew her clothes for her. She was there when she got home to always talk to her. It wasn't a a friendship of equals by, by any stretch. We're just not sure, but Karen keeps pushing. Uh, Naomi reluctantly, excuse me, Karen doesn't push. Naomi pushes and Karen reluctantly agrees to meet Max on the last day that Naomi is going to be in England. And why has Naomi come to England? It's not just to announce that she, her engagement to Max. Just like I mentioned that Karen was in um, Ireland, like I know that Ireland is this way, whatever, that she was in Ireland. Naomi has come to London because Naomi's aunt, So we have two aunts now involved in the story. Naomi's aunt has passed away. Naomi has inherited the house that she and Max are going to live in. But first, it has to be all packed up and all the old stuff has to go out and all of uh, so Naomi can prepare it for um, when she and Max uh, move in. So she's boxing up the house and that's where they agree to meet the last day they're in town so we can have what truly is a fateful uh, uh, reunion in a way of Max and Karen. I have highlighted so many parts of this book that uh, I could just spend uh, the entire time that we are together just reading what I feel are the beautiful, the beautiful, like, pearls of sentences uh, uh, that are strung together, that that propel the story backward, forward, and build tension throughout the book. But I really don't, uh, you know, I, want, I don't want to uh, uh, bore you with that. But I do want to tell you that this next scene that I am going to describe in the book has stayed with me from the first time I read this, this particular scene in the book. It went into my head and it became lodged there forever because it kept coming back to me, the scene, you know, whatever I was doing, I'd be shopping at Publix. I should, you know, I'm making dinner, whatever it is. I would think back to this particular scene where basically nothing happens. There's a lot of nothing happening in this book. That is so huge, so huge. But anyway, this next scene uh, was executed so beautifully that I've yet to read anything else that has had such a profound effect on me. And I I read a lot of stuff. So anyway, here's the scene. We are now, we are now at, at Karen, we are now at Naomi's aunt's house. We are in the backyard, okay? Who is we? Karen and Max are in the backyard. They're gonna have a little picnic out back while Naomi is making tea uh, and waiting for someone to come around and pick up some books uh, that someone has bought. And she's going to come out and bring the tea and they're all going to have a chat. That's all that happens. That's it. That's all that happens. That is so huge. The way the author describes what happens in that scene. So I'm just going to, as the author would say, take the lid off. And now I'm really going to tell you what happens. Let me just read the the first, this is chapter six. Naomi stepped through the window, in one hand, a brown teapot, in the other, a kettle with a trail of steam. Having been busy up to the last moment, 
she still wore a white overall over her dress and a white handkerchief around her head like a coif. Okay, so we basically now see Naomi as a servant, as really just um, uh, a supporting character in this scene as it's going to build. And the use of light and dark throughout this book, as one reader pointed out to me, is so beautiful. Uh, uh, this afternoon, the shadow under the tree lay on her as soothingly as the dark. This is how the tree is positioned next to Karen, who is already outside. Um, light coming on from the landing fell on her face, unconscious, intent, calm. But a word brought her to sit on your bed and talk in a whisper. I mean, it's just such beautiful writing, but okay, I'll stop. I'll stop right there. Okay, so um, so what happens in that backyard? What happens in that backyard? What happens is hardly any words are spoken, but what the author describes involving grass, the bending of grass, and two hands that barely touch change the lives of everyone that I just have discussed with you up to now. Okay. Oh, gosh, how do I even start? Okay, so here we go. What happens is in the backyard, we just have two people, just two people waiting. They're just waiting. They're waiting for Naomi to bring out the tea. <clears throat> and what happens when they bring out the tea? Karen and Max are sitting there staring at each other. They're not saying one word. They have their hands on the ground. Okay, they have their hands on the ground. Okay, and this is all grass, right? There is a touch. There's just the tiniest touch. And then they both lift their hands off of the ground. And the grass made an impression on the ground. And as they lift up their hands, the grass bends up. That may not mean anything to you, but I could have fallen off my chair the way the author uh, wrote that part. And although I'm... Uh, I'm looking for it here. I, I don't want to ruin it. I don't want you to hear my voice when you read this part. I want you to take it in uh, on your own because this description of what happens in this scene completely, it completely, um, it, it just, it, it, it had such a profound effect on me. And the reason why is because they, they are having this attraction through silence that they realize is wrong because they both need and love Naomi. So it's like this, this, I don't know what this trifecta, this triptych, this, this trio that we know uh, can't withstand time. So Naomi finally comes out. Here's this very sophisticated primal sexual attraction that's happening. And then you see Naomi clamoring out like she's the tea girl and um, setting the tray down on the little uh, settee that they have set up out there. And what happens? The, the, the entire intensity and silence and tension in that scene is shattered. Why? Because we no longer have this one-on-one -on -one intensity, but we have three. And the author says, with three or more people, there is something bold in the air. Direct things get said, which would frighten two people alone and conscious of each other in their nearness to one another. To be three is to be public. You feel safe. The person so close before becomes a face on the other side of a tray. I just love that. I just love that. Okay. <clears throat> and then we know that whatever is happening here, the doom is further sealed and the tension is made even greater. A man with two women devotedly watched by one, unwillingly watched by the other, often looks foolish. Whatever he does is too weighty. I just love that. And then the use of light, which is practically on every page of the book. A coin of light from the tree slid off Max's foot. 
Okay, if you have not fallen off your chair, I just want you to know that when I read that, I literally, how, how did she do that? I, it, it, such a beautiful economy of prose. And I've mentioned this before, the economy of prose is what makes this so incredibly, incredibly brilliant. And we know that all the time that this tryst is happening, the house is bearing down on them. The, the windows as eyes that are magnifying what's happening here can only lead to tragedy. I, uh, Yeah, this is a winner, okay? And we hear a clock tick, 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 like, you know, like Camus or something. I, I mean, it's just, I mean, think Ian McEwan, think Julian Barnes. And this is, uh, this is the type of style uh, that I just, I just lap it up. I just lap it up. I'm lapping it up. You're seeing me lapping it up. Okay. So moving forward, the tryst ends. There's a scene at the train station that's where they all part. That's something out of a 1940s film. I'm not going to go into it anything, any, any further, uh, because I realize I'm already going over the time I wanted to spend on this, but obviously if you listen to any of my presentations before, this doesn't surprise you. Uh, the next scene, uh, we are at uh, Karen's home in, uh, K- Karen's at home with her mother and father and they get the news that Aunt Violet has died. This postpones Karen's marriage that she's pretty much said, okay, this is what I'm going to end up with, Ray, and you know, the planning of the marriage. But this puts a halt. Again, we're dealing with time. This puts a halt on Karen getting married. And while all this, uh, you know, this um, planning for um, Aunt Violet's um, funeral and the uncle coming to visit, who is very sad, and all these things have, have to happen. Uh, uh, a phone call comes in the middle of the night, and even though there's no caller ID, Karen knows to answer the phone. She answers, she knows it's going to be for her. And of course, it is Max. Max is calling her. This is like a month after they saw each other in the backyard. He's like, I got to see you. And she's saying, we really shouldn't do this, but okay. And so they agree to meet in Boulogne the following week and they meet and they chat and they know, they know this shouldn't be happening. Uh, but they, they acknowledge that, okay, there's something going on here, but nothing happens the first time they meet again, even though we're thinking, okay, they're going to get together. The author goes, Oh no, not yet. Delete, 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 reel it in. Uh, and we, um, we have to wait for them to meet again. Uh, and they meet in England again uh, a week later and they consummate uh, their love. Uh, and even uh, then, even uh, when you think, okay, yay, they, they love each other. Um, they're going to get together. Let, let's just have this all work out. You so want just everything to work out, even though you know this is not good. And oh, wait a minute, Max is engaged to Naomi. And wait a minute, uh, Karen's supposed to marry Ray. Wait, okay, whatever. Let's just have it all work out. We feel that this is going to be bad because um, uh, where they meet, it's well, it's rainy, it's it's cloudy. Well, I mean. It seems like every book I've ever read about Britain, it's rainy, it's cloudy, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's damp. The wool's not drying on the sweat. You know, it's raining. It's dark. They they go to a um, a restaurant. Uh, places are very important in this book. Of course, the house in Paris itself, it's very restricting. It's, you know, dark. It's striped wallpaper on the walls, like bars in a, a prison. We go to this restaurant and Max even says, you know, I've had women here before, and, you know, you know. And Karen's like, ah, I shouldn't be here, but my God, he's so attractive. So I'm here. Okay, whatever. I digress. Uh, so um, what happens is Karen w- wakes up uh, and realizes, uh, although there's no way that she can, uh, she realizes she feels the presence of Leopold. And she even, uh, uh, the the author and Karen, because in one sentence, we we are switching uh, voice uh, because uh, Karen awakens in the middle of the night and develops a type of unconscious awareness of Leopold, despite having no clear evidence he will eventually exist. Uh, she says, all the same, the idea of you, Leopold, began to be present with her. I'm going to read it again. Because remember, we just got to go with it. Just go with it. All the idea, all the same, the idea of you, Leopold, began to be present with her. So to whom 
it, are these words speaking? Is this Leopold telling us the story? Perhaps, I, you know, it's, you just got to go with it. Don't question it. Let's just go on. So after they uh, make love and decide they want to get married, of course, Max doesn't know about Leopold uh, in this story, uh, but uh, or that she's pregnant yet. Uh, Max decides to write a letter to Naomi. There's a very dramatic 1940s movie uh, kind of scene that happens after this letter. Ultimately, in the end, they decide, look, we love Naomi, but we love each other even more. Even though we both know we're basically crummy people, uh, we're going to get married. So uh, we need to let Naomi know via a letter, and then Max is going to go sit down with her face to face, okay? Karen never sees Max again. She never sees Max again. Uh, she finds out about Max's suicide from Naomi, who again comes to her house and explains uh, that Max wrote her a letter uh, and said... Um, came to her house, uh, her mother met with Max. Also, uh, the next thing she knows, her mother's covered with blood and Max is nowhere in the house. He's, uh, he had slit his wrist and he's um, down in the ditch across the road. Karen then turns to Naomi and says, I'm pregnant with Max's child. Then the heavens open up and out comes an award, a big, big award. And it's awarded to Naomi because she is the friend of the century. Obviously I just made that part up, but I'm telling you, she is the friend of the century because what does she say to Karen? She's been betrayed. She's been betrayed by Max. She's been betrayed by her best, her, she thinks is her best friend, Karen, and come to find out even her mother. Uh, but she says, we're going to find a good home for that child because this is in the 1930s and no respectable woman who um, allegedly is engaged to marry some other guy, uh, Ray, can have a baby, can be a single mother. And that's where we end that chapter, that section. Now we go back to the present. And the author does this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, she begins with the last sentence from the first section of the book, which was, your mother is not coming. She cannot come. So it's almost like we're just going to continue right on. Because remember, what did I tell you? Beginning, this story takes place over one day. So now we're right back to where we were. Leopold is crushed. He goes to the mantle and we, and the mantle is a motif in this book. And what is a mantle? It is, uh, you know, the, uh, it, it bears the weight. It is the face of, it is strength. It, it's where the, the, the hearth lot, you know, it's all of these things you can interpret. Uh, he goes to the mantle and he falls apart. Henrietta, who is uh, one of these wise little girls who can pick up on other people other people pretty quickly and she has no parents so she's had to grow up kind of fast she feels a little maternal and she goes over and she kind of hugs leopold i think this is what you're supposed to do she tries to console him and then leopold is summoned upstairs do you see the balance in this book? I love balance. I love balance. I love duality. I love anything with two. So I love, I love, love, love how this book is structured. So now it is Leopold's turn to go upstairs. So we're balancing what happened at the beginning of the book. And now what will happen at the end of the book? So Leopold goes upstairs and he has to go into the scary room. Uh, and he uh, goes in there and he meets uh, Madame Fisher. And what do you think uh, she tells him? She tells him exactly what she told Henrietta, but she's more detailed. She's like, look, this is who your mother is. This is what happened to my daughter. This is who your father was. And I'm sorry, Leopold, but your mom's not coming. How do you think this child, this nine-year-old child reacts? He says to her, can I please stay here? What? Can I please stay here? because at least you're telling me the truth. This is a child who's been searching for his mother, who has been trying to find a sense of identity, who he really is, and no one is giving him a straight answer. Everyone is trying to protect him. Finally, 
someone gives him a straight answer and he wants to stay. The doorbell rings, just like at the beginning of the book, the doorbell rings. There's Naomi, a lot of going up and down stairs, a lot of things happen between the two rooms. Uh, uh, so Naomi up the stairs, she takes, uh, she whisked, me pulled out of the room. Uh, she, oh, they run back downstairs, kind of like those sound effects. She runs back downstairs and uh, they open the door to the drawing room. And who is standing at the mantel? Ray. 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 Ray of Hope. Ray of Sunshine. Ray. Ray, who we really don't hear much from throughout the entire book. It's mostly through letters. He's, you know, he is the most least developed character. Ray. Ray shows up. I was in shock the first time I read this because I wanted to be Karen. I wanted to be his mother. I want a closure. I want a happy ending. You know, I do like books that are fraught, but you know, I'm all for a happy ending as well. It's Ray. Why? I have so many. We, it's so all the questions, boom, 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 so many questions. It's Ray who comes and rescues, absconds, uh, takes into evidence, however you want to interpret that, and it's fascinating to interpret, it's Ray. He looks down at Leopold, and he's going to take, he, he's going to, you know, I, I'm here, um, I'm here. When you read the book, um, I don't want to give away everything, but there's a lot of dynamic things that happen in this last section. It ends very practically with, um, oh, since you're going to take Ray, I mean, excuse, since you're going to take Leopold, and by the way, Karen, who said she could not come, did make it to Paris, but she stopped at the hotel, basically had a mini nervous breakdown, we know how those go, uh, and she can't leave the hotel. She can't leave the hotel room. So it is Ray who makes an executive decision. Why? We can talk about that for like an hour and a half if you like, because there's so much there in this very thin book. Uh, but um, it is, it's Ray. Uh, so it's agreed that Ray, uh, since, you know, since you're taking Leopold, would you mind bringing Henrietta to the airport as well? And I will tell you that there is humor in the last, last few scenes of this book of this man who's never had children bringing two kids with him in a taxi. And in order to get to, you know, point A to point B, there's a lot of funny things that happen because, you know, someone's hungry, someone's dropping stuff, someone wants to go this way, someone wants to go that way. And this man's like, oh, my God, what have I taken on? But it is much more, much more serious than that because it leaves so many things open ending open ended is ray going to uh go somewhere else is he going to kidnap this child is he going to take um leopold to see karen uh, what what is leopold's life going to be after this what happens to henrietta poor henrietta I, we don't get to see anything of paris the entire time even though that's what we thought the book was about we don't get to see anything about paris nothing at all uh Oh, what is, uh, why would Ray do this without Karen? What is his point? Is he trying to say, here's the evidence, here's Ray, here's the, um, you know, the, the, the white elephant in the room. Here he is. Now, what are you going to do, Karen? Uh, who knows? Uh, everyone that reads this book takes away a different interpretation of all the secrets, of all the revelations, of all the, um, all the motivations uh, of all the characters, uh, that is the summary of The House in Paris. I, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, subscribe, hit the notification so you can see the next time um, that um, we'll have a new um, a book. Uh, but I, I hope you enjoy The House in Paris by Elizabeth Bowen. Like I said, uh, it is one of my absolutely favorite books. And just feel that you have been spared me reading you uh, all my favorite um, quotes from the book. Uh, but um uh, this has been quite a pleasure. Bye. If you are hanging around to hear more about uh, the house in Paris, well, you've come to the right place because we're going to go ahead. And I want to tell you a little bit, uh, just a little bit about the themes of this book and also uh, uh, the genre of uh, the, the style and how we, how we read this book. Uh, 
So first, I want to talk about the style. Yeah, I'm going to start there. Uh, this book uh, is uh, considered a lot of things. It's considered gothic suspense, uh, melodrama, comedy, documentary realism, highly wrought, uh, owing much to literary realism. We have an author that loved film, obviously that influenced her in, and filmmaking techniques. Uh, the, it is a slow paced build uh, throughout the book. Uh, it is also, like I said, time bending and intertwining. Uh, it's also been described as, uh, remember that song by the B-52s, Rome? Rome if you want to. Uh, it's definitely a Rome if you want to book because it uh, there's a lot of free indirect discourse use. Um, what is that you may ask? I wasn't sure so I looked it up. I thought it was kind of a stream of consciousness is but it's even more than that. So if you will um, just uh, here's a little um, explanation that I found. Free indirect speech has been described as, quote, a technique of presenting a character's voice partly mediated by the voice of the author. And I discussed this in the summary where we have uh, the author um, using the word Leopold and, you know, you, Leopold and her all in one sentence. It goes on, or reversing that emphasis, quote, that the character speaks through the voices of the narrator. Uh, and I, I was told by one of our readers, there's another book out called The Sympathizer that does something very similar to that, uh, with the voices effectively merged. And oh, yes, very effectively merged or confusingly er merged, depending on your interpretation. Uh, this has also been described as, quote, the illusion by which third part third person narrative comes to express the intimate subjectivity of fictional characters. The word free in the phrase is used to capture the fact that with this technique, the author can roam from viewpoint to viewpoint instead of being fixed with one character or one narrator. This is part of literary modernism or, or modernist literature that originated in the 19th and early 20th centuries. This is why, because after World War I, everybody was a hot mess. Uh, you know, there were no more rules. So, you know, do whatever you want. You know, let's try something new. This is why we have Dadaism and Cubism. You know, everyone is now pushing the limits. Uh, like Ezra Pound's maxim, quote, make it new. Uh, what comes of this? Well, we end up with the Lost Generation, the Bloomsbury Group, the Harlem Renaissance, books like this, uh, of this genre. Uh, this is also a book that uses the tension, um, uh, uses tension a lot. I'll, um, if you do have your book with you and you want to flip along with me, uh, I would say that um, page, um, page um, the, the cherry tree scene in the backyard that I referenced before is definitely um, a, a tension filled scene. This is where Karen realizes that she uh, loves Max. She was ashamed looking at Max across uh, of the unfair way uh, of her fancy, then her revenge of her fancy um, on him. She had misused him. I mean, she realizes that uh, she uh, truly, uh, she she's attracted to him. There's just no other way. There's no other way. Uh, it goes on. Uh, Many sensations of pleasure made up the moment hummed in the silence between Max and Karen like bees in a tree. Huh? The yellow brown brick house with its dark windows glared them down the lawn, uh, this this tension foreboding, not speaking, and their pleasure in not speaking made an island under the boughs of the cherry. But silences have a climax when you have got to sleep. You when you've got to speak. What can Naomi be doing? Max says, still standing beside the kettle. Well, she must be making it shy. Are you so thirsty? He said with an oddly inflected voice. This time tomorrow, you'll bo both be where? And I'm still at the train. We don't reach Paris until six. At his words, the English Channel rose to cut them off like a blade of steel. The fine weather, the fine weather blue of the sea would have 
tomorrow puffed into smiling ripples, could not distinguish from how fatal it was. She even smelt the salt air that would blow on deck. She said with the touch of a pretty woman extravagance, I feel you are both going away forever. Please miss us, said Max. But we are a couple of foreigners after all. Foreigners, though, belong somewhere else, and you and Naomi don't. I mean, it's just so, it hums, it hums, it hums with tension. It hums with tension. It's so beautiful. Okay, I digress. Uh, well, not, I don't digress too much. Uh, here we go. Um, indoors, Karen heard Naomi shutting the door. The carrier must have taken the box of books because, um, Naomi was waiting for the books to get picked up before she came outside with the tea. No doubt they were a set of classics better bound than the classics Helen Bond had already. Naomi would be pushing the handkerchief back from her forehead. This is what she would be doing. So this is what Karen is imagining she's doing in the house. We don't know if it's happening. Um, looking around to see what to do next. There was nothing left but to lock up the house. The church clock Lock, clock, struck six somewhere behind the gardens. They ought to start back soon. The poplars, the crimson showering cherry along the window belonged to the past already. An indoor chill, as in the same room where nothing ever goes on, began to settle on Karen. They both, But they both sat back, her hand lying near his. Max put his hands on Karen's, pressing it into the grass. There unexploring consenting touch lasted they did not look at each other or their hands when their hands had drawn slowly apart they both watched the flattened grass beginning to spring up again blade by blade can you even believe that even just happened? I mean, that is so powerful to me and to make it even more powerful Karen refers to Leopold as the impression they never made on the grass. Okay, E.L. Koningsberg once said, even though other people said it, I always attribute it to her. She said, you have to know the rules in this case of language in order to break them. And man, this author is a She's like the most amazing, amazing tailor, seamstress, uh, weaver of words. Profound. Okay. So tension. This is all about tension. Let me move forward. Uh, uh, this is an author who also crawls into this inside the mind of a child. And I think she nails it. Although some people feel that there's uh, that this is an author that is um, imbuing very adult like ideas into these children. I feel she or her voice of the children is absolutely spectacular. Uh, here's a quote about children in the book. There is no end to the violations committed by children quietly talking alone. You know, children are um, children are tough. Uh, okay, so um, uh, moving forward, the use of location. Uh, the house reminded me of Rebecca and Mandalay or Tara and Gone with the Wind uh, after the fire. You know, it's just this, you know, it is, it, it is a house doomed. It is a story doomed. <clears throat> uh, our author is, I'm moving now on to theme. Our author is interested, quote, life with the lid on and what happens when the lid comes off. Uh, she's interested in the innocence of orderly life and the eventual and the eventual irrepressible forces that transform experience. Uh, she is a master of imagination and and how imagination plays into the story because we are we are imagining uh with the characters in the book as we bend time of what is going to happen in the future even though we know the future of these characters is totally different and imagined uh, we are led to believe that this is their past by them I'm, it's just so crazy it's so crazy it is so crazy so let me just read this quote to you and this is taken from um 
uh, let's see, uh, the um, Ben Sinister Duration in Elizabeth Bowen's House in Paris by the International Fiction Review by Timothy Dow Adams. He says, Bowen herself described the, quote, bendability of time in an essay published in 1951, in which she discusses factitious, factitious memory. One route to the past, or the idea of the past, is factitious memory. That is to say, by art, we are made to seem to remember that which we have not actually known. So through art, we remember and we create something that didn't exist. We create and then we remember it. That is fascinating. She also intertwines the past and the present. She shows how the past affects our current day. Um, and all, all of the characters uh, do this. They are all playing with uh, the past and the present and playing with tension. And they are victims of the past, the present, and time. Betrayal, secrecy, and deception are all over every single page of this book. It is the main catalyst that occurs throughout the book. Madame Fisher betrays her own daughter. Uh, she actually, um, you know... It has been suggested that Madame Fisher loved uh, or had a thing for Max. And so when she saw that Max was going to marry uh, her daughter, she was bent on uh, breaking that up. Uh, she uh, Karen betrays her own mother when she doesn't tell her mother, oh, by the way, I was an out with a friend. I was actually sleeping with this guy, Max, uh, over, um, you know, at some cozy inn. Uh, she betrays her father because all Karen's father, well, uh, her mother and uh, Karen uh, betrayed the fa uh, Karen's father because all he wants is grandchildren, which ain't going to happen. Uh, Karen betrays Naomi because uh, P.S. Uh, sleeping with the front, uh, sleeping with Max. Karen uh, uh, also uh, betrays Ray. I mean, it's just it's all over the place. The question is: Is Naomi also betraying everyone? Which is very interesting. And is Madame Fisher just using? Is she like a puppet? She reminds me of Kate and East of Eden, the most scariest person ever that never existed, but still, she scares me to death. Okay, so I want to talk about. I don't want to go on too much more about betrayal. The theory of wounds, and this is from um, Andrew Bennett and Nicholas Royal. Uh, quote: "Fanatic immobility, the house in Paris, Elizabeth Bowen, and the dissolution of the novel." So, what do they say? about um, this, uh, this style and what Bowen does with the idea of wounding. Because of Karen's betrayal of Leopold, these two squal scholars uh, qualify the house in Paris as Bowen's most rigorous and unremittingly clairvoyant elaboration of the structure and the effects of psychic trauma. The house in Paris is what we propose to call, and I'm probably going to botch the, the pronunciation, but it's traumaturgy. So traumaturgy, both a work of wounds and a theory of wounds. So it's how works, how, how wounds are inflicted by betrayal, by secrets, etc. And then here is a story of wounds. So this is, again, this duality, which I just love. Okay. And let's not forget Ray, even though he's a ray of sunshine, a ray of hope, he does not get off scot-free because if he is going to go ahead and bring Leopold to his mother or adopt Leopold as his own, where does that leave his family, the adoptive family, the Moody family, the foster family in, um, in Italy? That's not very nice. Uh, so the sc scholars say that the reader is almost forced into being a detective to try to figure out the motive of, you know, we all have to be Poirot or Marple and figure out what the heck is going on. What is the motivation? Uh, and how fun would it be to look at these characters if you were like a therapist and decide and, you know, decipher each, you know, have them sit on your, your sofa and ask them to say, so what's on your mind? This book is not an endorsement of motherhood. No mother comes off looking good in this book. No mother. Uh, you know, uh, 
the, at the end of this book, are there any good mothers? Are there any good mothering decisions that are made in this book? Uh, Karen doesn't want to be like her mother. Karen's mother is quite the passive aggr aggressive woman as she does this power play to kind of squeeze out of Karen to tell her where she's been and what she's been doing because she knows perfectly well that she is not with her friend from art school hanging out together over a weekend because the friend calls and says, hey, where's Karen? Uh, we're supposed to blah, blah, blah. And the mother's like, oh, I'll take a message. I'll let you know. You called. I don't know what happened. Uh, meanwhile, Karen said, well, I've been out with my friend and that's where I'm going to spend the week. You know, it's a typical thing. So anyway, uh, Karen says of her mother at one point, she has made me lie for a week. She will hold me inside the lie till she makes me lose the power I felt I had. So it's the power of lies and what we do with them. And of course, Madam Fisher, uh, uh, what does Max say about Madam Fisher? She acted on me like acid on a plate, which I have come to learn um, means that acid uh, is used uh, for decorations on plates. So it becomes like uh, part of the plate. Uh, it's, it's a type of method in order to seal artwork on China, I suppose. But anyway, uh, so this woman has a, an effect on you. And once she crawls in and settles on you, you know, it's like some kind of virus. It ain't going anywhere, kind of grows inside you like a tumor. And that is why I say she reminds me of Kate, um, Kate in East of Eden for sure. For sure, because once this person's in, she's once described as quasi vampiric. Uh, so uh, horrible. In fact, you could even surmise that she is responsible for Max's suicide because she is in the drawing room with Max, not Naomi when Max slits his wrists and runs from the house. And she says later, well, I was commending him on his fine match, basically, between she and Karen, uh, between he and Karen. And that's when he kind of loses it. Why? Well, we can psychoanalyze that. But basically, he is he is revealing to everyone that he is not a good person. But everyone still wants him anyway. And there's this whole, you know, uh, let's talk about how uh, Max, as a, a Jewish man, is portrayed in this book not well. Uh, and, you know, there's a suspicion because he is Jewish, he is foreign. Uh, you know, he uh, rather womanishness. Uh, he has no money. He, he's looking for money in all these tropes. They're all there, you know, blinking lights. Uh, I always argued that uh, if we uh, wanted uh, our authors to have no racism and no bigotry, we would walk into the library and we would in the bookstores and we would see very shiny shelves with nothing on them. And we would go into museums, uh, you know, if we expect of our artists to be angels and we'd see nothing on the walls, but nice Benjamin Moore, you know, white paint. Uh, so, uh, what I take away from this book, and if you are bothered by uh, the 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 Jewish stereotypes, which are indeed ugly, uh, I would say Bowen offers us to understand literature and how authors interpret society and portray society at that time. Okay. So we learned something, right? And now that you know this information, instead of being angry at the author, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And if you want to know more on what to do about it, I suggest uh, you go to searchingforidentity.org and see what else I do. And I'm not talking about books because, P.S., there's a hell of a lot you can do about it. I digress. All right, moving forward, uh, I want to... Um, point out to you uh, again about the house and how the, you know, the use of the house in building the tension is so obvious. Uh, here is how it is described at the beginning of the book. It is uh, creepy, stuffy, dark uh, inside the house. Here's quote inside of the house with its shallow door panels, lozenged doorknobs, polished brass ball at the end of the banisters, stuffy red matte paper with stripes so artfully shadowed as to appear bars was more than simply a not was simply novel to Henrietta. It was antagonistic as though it had been invented to put her out. You know, she's a little full of herself. She's a little full of herself. She felt the house was acting. Nothing seemed to be natural. Objects did not wait to be seen, but came crowding in on her. Each one what amounted to an aggressive cry. This is a scary house. This is a haunted house. Uh, the house in Twickenham, uh, Naomi's deceased aunt's home in Twickenham is similarly described. I hope I pronounced that right. Though there is a suggestion of future redemption. Quote, the aunt's house was hollow completely dead. Uh, 
but someone else would move in almost at once and be here next spring, no doubt, to enjoy the cherry. And you can go ahead and analyze the cherry all you want, not going there. Okay, uh, and uh, let's talk about the motifs that are so beautiful throughout the book of light and dark. On page 136, gold with the evening sunshine, crystal candlesticks that shoot rays out, pink, flame, prismatic, uh, the nature in the book, the bending of the grass, it's so Emersonian, uh, the lupines, the trees, the clouds, the poplars, the daisies, the cut grass, the flowers, I just love it. And then hands, 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 hands. Uh, from the book, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. M's, because I can't pronounce Karen's last name. Is it Michaelis? Is it Michaelis? I don't know. And I'm not going to watch or listen to the BBC because I don't, they did something on this book in uh, 1959 because I don't want it to ruin my, this very special experience I'm having. The hands, Mrs. Michaelis, Mrs. M's hands now closed, trembling and hair and Karen's uh, saying, this is not the worst that will happen, Karen, she said, as they both saw the, the crack across the crux. Excuse me, I really botched that quote. This is not the worst that will happen, Karen, she said, when they both saw the crack across the crust of life. And then what Karen says about Leopold, he would be the mark our hands did not leave on the grass and everyone is touching the mantle with their hands. And we're all watching the clocks, the hands on the clock. At one point, Karen says she didn't, when after she sleeps with Max, uh, she didn't know an hour passed except by um, noticing that she had lost an hour on the, on the luminous uh, glowing um, numbers on the clock face. Oh my gosh. There's so much beautiful alliteration um, throughout the, this book <clears throat> and also humor um, and, and very wise quotes quote about um, humor is being satisfied you are right irony being satisfied that they should think you are wrong I love that uh, or um, oh there's just so many it, I just um, buildings bass like cats in the kind heat jealousy is no more than feeling alone against smiling enemies karen looked at a vase of roses on a metal table Ugh. then around the restaurant with its embossed brown paper in which they were shut up with what madame fisher had said their worlds were, okay another quote their worlds were so much unlike that no experience had the same value for both of them. This is Karen and Max. They could remember nothing that they could speak of. And memory is to love what the saucer is to the cup. Memory is to love what the saucer is to the cup. You need to have shared experiences to be close. You need to build a history together. She only knew she had, oh, here it is by the thing on the clock. She only knew she had slept by finding an hour missing on her luminous watch. These hours are only hours. They cannot begin, but no hours. Oh, is it a room? Okay, I cocked that up. So I'm just going to go to the page because I don't want to ruin Elizabeth. I'm so sorry. I'm just very excited. Okay, so let me go. I'm going to on page 165. Yeah, I have a highlighted. See that I can't do the thing right because I don't know what's going on with the anyway. She asked herself, What what have I done? At about three o'clock, she only knew she had slept by finding an hour missing on her luminous watch. She thought how frightening luminous watches are. The eye of time never stops watching you. I love that. I really love that. Oh my God. Okay, so I can't, I can't, I can't, I'm, I'll just start reading again. Okay, everyone waited for the train to impale them in London, which is such a prescient quote, uh, considering right now, and um, there's strikes all over uh, the railway system right now in, um, in England. Okay, so I have another name for the title of this book, and it is The Worst Layover Ever. <laughs> I just thought I'd say that. Okay, uh, I want to go ahead and... Um, let you know that Henrietta, um, one of our readers said this, and I think it was brilliant. She said, Henrietta is a foil. 
And I love that because you really think, and if you read reviews about this book, it starts out with Henrietta and Henrietta gets, and it's a book about Henrietta and she, and it's not about Henrietta. Henrietta is me, merely like a, a tour guide or like the maitre d' at a restaurant who's going to seat you at the table because we're never, ever, ever, ever in this book going to see any sights in Paris with her. She's strictly there to build this layer of tension and then to take us on, you know, to the next location. You know, we're going to, we meet her at the train station and then we're going to see her off at the train station. And in the middle, she's just hanging out in that drawing room, right? Uh, this book is, has not, so when people ask what this, you know, so what book are you reading? What is this about? Well, you know, I don't even know what to say. It, uh, it's a book about how the little is so extraordinary. Is so extraordinary. I go back to that bending blades of grass one by one, each blade of grass. Okay. All right. Um, a little bit about the book that was published in 1935. Her um, publisher, Victor Gollins, uh, wrote to her and he said, quote, I wonder if you realize how un-English it is. This is taken from Victoria Glendinning or Glendinning's uh, autobiography, uh, Elizabeth Bowen, a portrait of a writer. Uh, anyway, uh, why is this book on English? I'm not quite sure because I, I could go in many different directions. I'm curious to what you think if you want to leave your comments uh, below. Uh, but I'm thinking because it exposes all the secrets and maybe you're not supposed to do that. Uh, perhaps because it's modernist and we're just really hopping on that wave and we're not quite used to it yet. And it's just so different in what it does. It's not following what has come before. So it's a little out there. Maybe that's his way of saying it's a little out there. I don't know, but it doesn't matter because it was published in 35 by Knopf um, uh, in the U.S., then in 72, and then in 87, and then in 2002. So this book has staying power. And P.S., Virginia Woolf loved it, so I love that. Uh, why don't you know about Elizabeth Bowen? So if you've not heard of this author, um, it's B-O-W-E-N. <laughs> what little I could find about why we don't know anything about her, which in and of itself is hard to find information on, uh, is because um, she can be classified in many different ways. And I would add, maybe she didn't have a very good publicist. I don't know. But also, um, she's considered an Irish author as well. And I'll tell you a little bit more about her bio and uh, what she has written. And evidently, uh, something called Irish studies has only developed uh, in recent times, I would probably say, uh, since we read Edna O'Brien and the, um, the Country Girls, I can understand that a little better. Uh, but um, maybe uh, in the 20th century is when Irish studies uh, developed, but I think all studies, all these kinds of studies things are kind of new anyway, from smart people I know that are professors, uh, they talk about, you know, the evolution of, you know, how we educate and things like that, and the whole idea of studies, you know, Jewish studies, African American studies, European studies, all this stuff is kind of new, I think, don't quote me. But anyways, okay, so anyway, uh, it says, um, let's see, who is this? Who is writing this? This is um, Chris Hopkins, Elizabeth Bowen, a review of contemporary fiction says, quote, situating her in a European context, she is heir to Henry James and Forster in Virginia Woolf as, quote, what came after Bloomsbury? Okay. Only as Irish studies developed was she placed back in her albeit conflicted Irish context. Uh, the resultant compartmentalization has, as Heather Laird, one of the contributors uh, to uh, the book, what's the book called? Um, Elizabeth Bowen, um, uh, Dublin and Portland Irish American Press 2009. Uh, one of the contributors that this particular book points out led to a number of separate approaches to Bowen. We have Bowen the modernist, the woman writer, the Anglo Irish writer, the writer on war, the Burkean conservative, and, and the cosmopolitan modernist. I guess meaning uh, if you're so chopped up in so many different categories, maybe you get overlooked. I don't know. You tell me what you think. All right. I want to wrap. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> I want to wrap and just tell you a brief bit about her life. 
But before that, I can't wrap because I have to give uh, some context. Do we really want to know about an author when we read a book? That's a question for another time because you are going to find out about Elizabeth Bone. But it is a question worth exploring. Why? I will give you two words. Irene Nemirovsky. Have fun with that. And then we can come back to that another time. If you're interested and you want to know more about Irene Nemirovsky and that question I just asked you, do you really want to know about your authors? All I have to say is be careful if you meet your heroes and let me know in the comments below. So who is Elizabeth Dorothea Cole Brown? She was born in 1899 as she passed away in 1973. She's considered an Anglo-Irish novelist, short story writer. She's notable for her books about the big house of Irish landed Protestants uh, and fiction about life in wartime London. She was born in Dublin in 1899. Her father was a barrister. And get this, because I love learning about family histories, they can date their family back to the 1500s of Welsh origin. I'm sure there's a lot of stories there. Okay, she grew up in Bowen's Court in Kildory, I probably pronounced that wrong, I apologize, County Cork, where she spent her summers in 1907, so she's eight years old, her father becomes ill, mentally ill, her and her mother moved to England, scratch, she and her mother moved to England, uh, in 1912, her mother dies, so she's brought up by aunts and governesses. In 1918, her father remarries. She's educated at the Down School. I'm sorry, I've got to let the dog out. I'll be right back. But I'm still talking. I'm so sorry. She's educated at the Down School, and I hope you can still hear me. Go on, Coco. Go on, tonight. And that at the Down School is where she meets her, uh, where she has her first success as um, an. Um, she makes some friends. Some of them uh, are with the Bloomsbury group. Uh, and she, she meets a friend, Rose McCauley, Dame Emile Rose McCauley, who um, helps her get her first novel, novel published. Uh, was it a novel? No, nope. collection of short stories called Encounters. Uh, she marries also that year in 1923 to Alan Cameroon, who is an education administrator, works for the BBC. It is said to be a um, sexless but contented union. If you were with us when we uh, discussed Vita Sackville's West, All Passion Spent, and if you haven't, uh, uh, I suggest you go back and listen to that video because that is an amazing book, All Passion Spent by Vita Sackville West, also told in three parts also a slim novel, packs a powerful punch, lots of humor, great perspective. I'm digressing back to this book. <clears throat> uh, so um, it's a, uh, a, a relationship that's never consummated. However, uh, she does have various uh, affairs. So don't worry about her. Uh, she has one that lasts over 30 years. She has another with an Irish um an Irish writer, and an American poet, uh, May Sarton. Uh, anyways, uh, so she socialized with a lot of people when she and her husband lived in Oxford. All these people are very smart, academic writer types that I don't know who they are, but I probably should. But anyways, she's going to parties that we would all like to go to. In 1929, she she publishes a book, uh, The Last September. Does it ring a bell? It should, because there was a great movie called by September, that was published in 19, uh, that came out in 1999. It was with a great cast, including Kirsten Thomas. I'm really bad with actors and actresses. Uh, but Maggie Smith, Michael Gambon, David Tennant, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I remember this film uh, because it was like um, the big chill if it were the 1920s. And they all, they're all meet or the 19 teens and they all meet at this house out in the country and all these things happen and identities are revealed and love trist and blah, blah. Anyway, I suggest you go find it and watch it because it is a great, great um, film. So I'm sure it's a great book too. Uh, she publishes uh, some more novels. She continues to write. In 1935 uh, is The House in Paris and uh, 38, Death of the Heart. In 37, she becomes a member of the Irish Academy of Letters. I promise I'm almost done. I promise. In 1930, she becomes the first and only woman in her family to inherit Bowen's court. Uh, then the war hits. She works for the British tree. Uh, the, I just combined British and ministry and I made British tree. 
So you heard it here. The British Ministry of Information uh, reporting on Irish opinion, particularly on the issue of neutrality. Uh, she was a Burkean conservative that when I Googled that means she's basically a Tory. Uh, uh, and then in 1948, uh, she writes a book, The Heat of the Day, about the Blitz and a, a, a relationship that happens then. In 52, her husband retires and they settle at Bowen's court. Unfortunately, he dies a few months later. Do not worry about Elizabeth. She has her portrait painted by this amazing Irish portraiture artist. And she's like looking out of the window from Bowen's court to this beautiful landscape. Everyone should have a portrait like that painted. Uh, uh, and uh, she travels to Italy writes um, researches to prepare for a book called A Time in Rome. Uh, she has a salon uh, at Bowen's Court. Who's there? Well, everyone, we would want to be there. Uh, Virginia Woolf, Eudora, Eudora Welty, Carson McCullers, Iris Murdoch. Uh, but you know what? Having a, a, a big a big house, a country house, takes money. And much like, like Mark Twain, she's got to go on the lecture circuit. So she goes to the U.S. and she lectures uh, in order to keep up the house, uh, <clears throat> but she can't, she can't keep it up. So she has to sell it in 59. And unfortunately it's demolished in 1960. Bummer. Then she spends years really without a permanent home. She finally settles in, I think it's pronounced in Churchill, Hyaf, H-Y-T-H-E. Please someone tell me how to pronounce that. In 1965 and 68, she's still writing. Remember she was born in 1899. Uh, in 1968, her final novel, Eva Trout, or Changing Scenes, is published and nominated for a booker. What's it about? Uh, it's about a, um, a young heroine abandoned by her mother just after birth, raised by nurses, nannies, and educated by governesses, all hired by her millionaire father, has difficulty acting and behaving like an adult when shortly after her father's suicide, she inherits all his money. In 72, she develops uh, lung cancer and dies in 73. The first autobiography about Elizabeth Bowen comes out four years later by Victoria Glendinning, uh, G L E N D. I N N I N G. Uh, she uh, her house when she lived in Regent's Park has one of those like, in, those little English plaques. In 2012, it was put there, and there's another one uh, to mark the Bowen residence in the Croft Headington, uh, a blue plaque there as well. And uh, that is all on her biography. So to sum up. I'm never, ever really going to talk about or be excited about reading hot books that are uh, by um, most of my living. I don't read, a, a, I don't like to uh, facilitate a lot of books that are uh, uh, contemporary uh, by authors who are aerobic living. So I prefer, I prefer to uncover those gems uh, kind of like uh, All Passion Spent or like this book, A House in Paris that you normally wouldn't read because I feel it makes for such amazing conversation. We get to learn about, um, you know, the behind the scenes of what's what's not necessarily the most hot or uh, discussed books. And we get to learn about uh, slices of life that aren't the most the most popular but this is quality this is really quality stuff so i encourage you i encourage you to read the house in paris i encourage you to discuss it with your friends and i encourage you to come back the next time uh when i promise we'll have a wonderful um uh, book and discussion as well. If you were looking for the discussion portion of this that was on Zoom, I will give you the full mea culpa of what happened the first time, which is I um, I recorded it on the wrong device. Don't ask. Uh, but I recorded it wrong device. So I promised I would do it again. And when I went to do it again, uh, Zoom crashed, but I know it was user error. Anyway, so Zoom crashed. I'm going to explain it on Zoom. Uh, so uh, this is the third time. It's a charm. So you don't get the whole discussion, but you get everything <laughs> that I uh, explained in this extended uh, analysis. And I tried to bring in what other people have said and shared with me, although I, I couldn't bring it all in because everyone who attends our discussions is so smart and I learned from all of you. So I can't possibly bring it all in except to say that uh, 
reading the book for some people was pure torture. And that's okay. Uh, very few people like the book. And that's okay, uh, because that's not what this book club is for. It's not to come together and I'll go, oh, we so love this book. It's to learn and expand our horizons and explore uh, nooks and crannies between the pages that we normally wouldn't look if we were on our own. Uh, I encourage you to ask questions in the comments below. Give your comments in the comments below. And if you have a book that you think fits the criteria for being a chapter and notes title, let me know, because always, always looking for that next gem to uncover. Thank you so much. Uh, if you liked this video, please like, subscribe, you know, do all the YouTube things you're supposed to do. And um, realize that um, if you do decide to join the book club at chapterandnotes.com, please note that all proceeds from the book club support my nonprofit, uh, searchingforidentity.org. And you can check out our website to learn what we do there. Uh, so your book and reading your membership and us reading stories about stories actually supports capturing real stories of real people. So that's what I do on the other. That's what I do over here. But right now over here, this is what I do. And I absolutely love it. So uh, thank you so much. And um, I'll see you next time. Bye.